My name's Richard Stamp. I'm 54 years old. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with penile cancer, cancer of the penis. That means I've had most of my penis removed, which was the worst day of my life. Apart from Arsenal losing to Leeds in the 1972 Cup final. I was just a normal bloke before all this happened, an Arsenal lover, a father of two, who enjoyed a beer with his mates. Then one day, out the blue, I was told by a doctor my penis had to be removed immediately or I was going to die. So the penis came off and since then, I've been trying to work out how the hell I exist without a cock. How to live, work, have sex, go to the toilet. Here it goes. How to be a bloke without having a penis. But I'm not settling for that, which is why I've been on the journey to find the best replacement the world has to offer for my lost dick. Plastic ones, prosthetic ones, even ones grown in laboratories. It is representing my insides. Yeah. So then when you want to have sex, you get you locate this little pump. Right. Oh, could you pop your button on again? Make no mistake, losing my penis has made me question who the hell I am. He said, forget being a man. Forget being a man. I, and I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't know. Yeah. But I've remained determined, and this is my story. The story of a lost penis and the hunt for a new one. Sit on the bed and pull your pants down. Here's your penis, okay? You got a couple of bands going down here, right? Your tumor's here. Whole lot's gonna come off, okay? That's it. That was me on stage. I've been a professional idiot, or performer, for over 30 years. And my way of coping with the trauma of losing my penis was to write a show about it, with some unusual props made by dear friends. It's not every day I get the honour, I suppose, if that's not a funny way to put it, of making a coffin for your mate's dick. But it's a good size. There's a lot less room inside than I thought. <laughs> You were my first male friend, <laughs> first go-to friend that I just went... I didn't know what to I'm say. I'm fucked, Dave. I am totally and utterly... I've just been delivered the worst ever news that you would expect. Beyond, like, the amputation side of it, forget being a man. Oh, my God. Forget being a man. You've got to forget that, take that out of your head. And I remember just before the operation, going in to, to go under and, and thinking, I'm going to run away. I'm going to get off this table and get out now. I don't want to do this. I can't handle it. And then, you know, the realisation is like, you just go, where am I going to run to? I've got nowhere to fucking go, have I? Once I was back home, I had to start thinking about the practicalities of life. Having no penis meant I was now effectively disabled. I come here, I either sit down on the toilet and piss, girl-like, to use the oven or whatever, um, like, Normally you just get down, open the door, da da da. Um, I kind of do like sort of, sort of a few moves to do it. And then at this point, I've got quite a lot of pressure. This is the other thing I piss out of. And this is the thing I'm about to piss out of. I don't know quite what it's for. I think it's to do with pregnancy or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's um, weird. Not being able to work. End up on fucking universal credit being treated like a complete mug, being asked to go for tests, being asked to do this, do that, you know, for a pittance. 
I have to drop my trousers. Oh, you can close the door if you want. No, fuck it. Here it goes. I've got a good arse. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's changed life completely. Um, and it's really, really frustrating that side of it, you know. Flush. Wash my hands. My life just felt fucked, and the only way I knew how to cope was through booze and the support of good friends, like Kathy, who kept me sane during my recovery. I mean, you were the first person to see my red raw bollocks in hospital. Yes, yeah. But as I said to you at the time, it's fine, I can, I can do poker face, and then I can go, oh, I'm a lesbian, I don't know what else I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> No, but oh. like, like I mean, yeah. uh, basically, but, well, you know, like it's been like a year and a half or something, and I suppose that, that now I'm just like kind of just going like, the, I don't know where the, what the fuck is going on. I think you've been fucking brilliant in, through all this, really. Really, mate. I don't know what I'm doing, what that's about. Uh -huh. I want sex. I'm kind of like loose. I still have to sit on the toilet and pee like a like a girl. Um, but but I, and I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't know because I'm like in between worlds. Yeah. I'm in between worlds, and that's the thing. It's like, am I going to stay like this, or am I going to like? Mm, Woo! Have a, like, a new fucking penis. Before I could properly start thinking about a new dick, I had to make sure the cancer hadn't come back. They told me it would take five years to get the final all clear. This was my 13 month checkup with the brilliant man who had removed my old penis. These days are always like a little bit nerve wracking. Um, because you kind of know what to look for yourself, like checking for lumps in the groin, but you don't really know. I've had a few sort of infection -y things recently. Um, I don't know. I get more scared when I'm actually there. The last couple of weeks or so, I've kind of had a rash around the sort of testicle area. Um, I'm still getting sort of hair, sort of hairs built up in, in the sort of actual area, penis area. Um, and um, I still have problems sort of bending over and just moving kind of thing. Have you noticed any ulcerative areas or any lumps or anything that shouldn't be there that no, I clearly I know you any. keep a close eye on? Yeah, no, I haven't noticed any. OK. So, yeah. Penile cancer is an extremely rare cancer. It affects somewhere between 400 to 600 men a year. The symptoms that uh, somebody might experience, first of all, they may notice a lump growing on the penis, and this can be anywhere. It can be on the foreskin, it can be on the glands penis which is the head of the penis or it can occur um, just in, it can occur inside the water pipe the, the the urethra or it can occur on the on the shaft or the body of the penis okay so the groins feel fine that's good there's no that's no good. lymph nodes or anything that i can feel the risk yeah. of recurrence now starts falling off right um, but it hasn't fallen to zero no, yet so no, that's no, why no. we have to keep a close eye on yeah. you and keep reviewing you uh, and that's why we wouldn't want to put you through reconstructive surgery just yet. I kind of expected I didn't have the cancer had come back. I mean, that's good. I mean, the daunting thing is the normal reconstruction of when they take out part of your arm and they use that to build up the new penis and they take out part of your arse. Um, and it's several operations. That to me is way too daunting. That just fills me with total fear. With surgery not an option, 
So began my hunt for an alternative dick. I started contacting some companies making prosthetic limbs. If they could create arms and legs, then why not a cock? So then we'll know what we're playing with, really. It could be like some kind of strap-on dildo I could use for going to the loo and having sex, like a robotic penis. I'd be at the frontier of this, quite liking to be this sort of, like, odd one out. You know, the curiosity, the freak, you know, the man with the, you know, barnic man, basically. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. My hunt for a new penis had begun, and the first stop on my journey was Bristol, where I'd found a laboratory that designed robotic limbs. They hadn't made a robotic penis before, but there was a trailblazing professor with some pretty cool ideas. So here we have a, a simple yep. structure, which is basically a plastic tube with rings on it. Yep. And if I put air in it, then you see that the muscle contracts and uh -huh. it's lifted about three kilograms. Wow. And all of that from something Wow. Which is really thin and lightweight. Well, so, so that would kind of be a penis sort of thing? Is well, that, is that... I think this is down to your imagination how you would, you would see these. Let me show you some work that we've done. This is actually a robot that moves, and it's a, it's a robot with three segments. Okay. And what happens is we put fluid in each one of those segments, and we move them around, and this is a robot that will move across the table. Okay, so, so this basically is representing my insides. Yeah, so this is the so muscle that this would drive is the attachment. your yeah, appendix. So this is my muscle. See, I still get erections, even yeah. though the, the penis is sort of like buried kind of thing. And, you know, I, I do really feel mm. that. So that, that I am getting those feelings anyway. So would that... I guess this would help to enhance or work with that. Would I be able to, like, by next year, be able to come and see you and try something out, you know? Yeah, I think your goal of having full autonomy and to restore function is something that we totally believe in. Yeah. And, and we would like to work towards that. Yeah. We've got, I think, many of the building blocks to enable that. And still there needs to be much work done in this area. But I think we've kind of got the building blocks. It will probably take a year or two to come yeah. up with something which is functional and really does give a, a, you know, a real benefit to your daily life. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess... I want it to feel like more like me rather than a, an object, you know. I can't imagine going to bed with a girl and saying, hey, listen, um, hmm, I've got this little whizzy thing on the end. <laughs> yeah, and I can put some knobbly bits on it too, if you like. You know, I don't know. Back in London, the idea of a plastic penis wasn't really working for me. I wanted something that felt more like my own. So I started looking further afield and found the oddest sounding place in America, a lab where they were growing penises. Yes, an actual cock farm. From what I'd read, they were using the patient's own stem cells and then effectively cooking you a new penis. It sounded like something out of Alien. Before going, I was just like, really like going, this is going to be bloody great. This is going to be quite amazing. And cool, I might be the first guy to have this done as well. Um, uh, yeah, so very, very optimistic. <laughs> I had no idea if this place was real or whether they could grow me one. But if there was even a chance, then I had to find out. So I booked a flight and began the long journey across the Atlantic. Dreaming of a new penis, wondering what on earth it would look like. It was all just a bit surreal. The answers would be found off the beaten track in a strange little place called Winston-Salem in North Carolina. It's a very important trip. We're going to find out tomorrow what the possibilities are of having, um, having a new penis. I wouldn't have thought I would be here now.
without a penis that going to a cock farm. No. <clears throat> I wouldn't have thought that. I still knew almost nothing about this weird science, or whether this was just something they'd made up on the internet. But either way, it seemed that the news had spread of the cockless man that walked among them. Good morning and welcome to Piedmont Perspectives. I'm your host, Ed Skirka, and with me today is Richard Stamp. Richard, you're going now through a process of, I would think, a fairly lengthy process of what's the next step. They're looking towards, I think, the next, the next six months or so, over the next year or so, that they'll actually start um, helping guys that have lost part of their penis, like maybe just the top or some part. So I arrived at the Wake Forest Medical Institute as something of a local celebrity. With penis transplants still largely untested, and the idea of having another person's cock just too weird. It looked like here I might have a mind-blowing opportunity to actually grow back my own. We've got a lot of soldiers coming back with these really extensive battlefield wounds, um, and a lot of times they will affect areas that you can't just replace with uh, a normal donor tissue. Um, so one of those would be like the uh, reproductive organs. Um, so potentially we could take a CT scan or um, an image of another patient or something and recreate that three-dimensional structure and potentially implant it one day. They wouldn't show me any actual penises, but they did show me the same process with a human urethra. This was the structure made by a 3D printer being covered in the patient's stem cells. That was then placed in a furnace-like oven which replicates the human body and hey presto. Being a, a surgeon, uh, you know, when we are in surgery, we try to reconstruct as much as possible, as you know. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, often, we do not have the tissues that we need for reconstruction. And that's where regenerative medicine comes in, where we can, we have the potential to hopefully engineer tissues using the patient's own cells to replace functionality in that specific organ, wherever that organ may be in the body. Mm -hmm. And we have also been experimenting, of course, with penile tissue. Yeah. I mean, from my point of view, in a sort of selfish way, you know, is there a, is there a chance that this could be something that I could possibly look into for myself? We are now uh, really entering the very first stages of clinical trials for humans uh, with these tissues for smaller defects. And the hope is really to get these technologies advanced in patients far enough we can create more substantial uh, uh, tissue uh, structures for larger defects uh, and eventually, hopefully, uh, for uh, you know, a large replacement. Right, okay. But that's years and years at the moment, really. Yeah, the whole regulatory process takes years, really. Right, okay. Okay. I thought, you know, from what I've been told, that they were very close to actually doing this operation. So, you know, they could do this operation. And now they, you know, the guy was saying, you know, the doctor said, obviously they couldn't. So, you know, that is disappointing. I travelled a long way, put my faith in science, and it really felt like I'd been kicked in the balls. Before I left, I needed some form of hope. So on a whim, I went to visit a street tarot reader. Maybe there was something in the cards to restore my faith in the future. And I asked that you would guide me and that you would lead me to what need to be said. Amen. I had a very bad form of cancer where um, I, I had an amputation of my penis. I had penile cancer. With, with this situation, you, you, you prove to have a lot of strength. I don't let, th let it stop me. You know, I, uh, I kind of carry on. So, whereas other people may not be able to handle it. It's very sensitive. 
situation. Yeah. Do the cards say that um, I will be able to get a new penis? Well, you know, you never know how life will, what life will do for us. The answers clearly weren't in the spirit world either. It seemed my hunt for a new penis had reached a dead end. Yeah, I felt really down afterwards. I mean, like you were saying, oh, you know, don't feel so bad about it, it wasn't that bad. But I was just going, no, this is bad. This isn't going to happen. This ain't going to happen in my lifetime, really. It had been a year and a half since having my penis removed and my quest for a new manhood had come to a standstill. So I went back to St George's in Tooting to exercise the demons, to the place where my life had changed forever and the nurse had become my friend. And that was one of the most awful things that I've ever done in my life. Really. You know, looking back on it, that was just like... It was pretty horrific. When you described to me what had happened to me, that just really, really just broke me while I was crying in your arms. And then I was crying with Sister Katie as well. And it was, but, you know, like you said, you know, the, there was no other option than, you know, it's this or, 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 or die, you know, so that was kind of like... We wanted to get all of it, and that's, unfortunately, we had to get a little bit more than we thought we needed. Yeah. But we wanted to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Chris was the Macmillan nurse who showed me the results of the operation, how I looked without my penis. You had your plan way of doing it. Three options, wasn't it? The three <laughs> options, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, um, the uh, lift the gown and you'll tell me, tell me uh, uh, what you can see. And then the um, uh, give me your phone and I'll take a picture and you look at it later or just do it straight away and look at it now. And um, we did all three options. We yeah. did in the end, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That penis had given me the best things in my life, two beautiful children. I'd lived life to the full, loads of parties, great friends, and I travelled all over the world. My penis was bloody brilliant, and being able to have sex, to orgasm, for a while after the operation, I thought, has that gone forever? I'd been told that the sexual side of me will, will come back. So basically, I went, I went back that night and kind of... You know, just went, right, OK, I'm going to try and have a wank, you know. So I had all my, my wank thoughts going on. I'm not telling you those. And then I kind of rubbed myself like, like you'd uh, rub, rub a kind of clitoris because, remember, it's kind of like a sort of belly button-y kind of thing, but, but um, it kind of, when, it, when you rub it, it get an erection. It's sort of like kind of... As, part of it comes out kind of thing it gets bigger and then you know and and then um and then I come it takes a little while but you know just put your mind to it if you put your mind to something get it done I was truly grateful that I could still orgasm but then I had to work out how to do that with a partner how to share my new body with someone I miss my penis. I miss having that part of me. I don't proudly look at myself and go, fucking hell, you look great down there. Because I don't particularly. But, you know, I have had sex with other people and, and, and they haven't particularly looked in that area either. They just know how to make, make me come or whatever. But, you know, they don't, you know it's not, uh, no, no one sucks my dick or that I haven't done that process yet. I'm not that comfortable with it. I still have hard-ons, you know. You still, there's still something that gets hard there. Um, 
but uh, it's been, yeah, it's different. It's obviously different because it's not, there's not penetration involved, you know. But some women don't mind. Uh, but it's, it's strange to show your body to a person, obviously. It's embarrassing. As one girl said recently, isn't it cute, you've got a pussy? And I went, oh. When I thought about it, it had been a long time since I'd actually had sex using my penis. Even years before the diagnosis, when I'd been with my ex-lover, Angie. I've got you this little gift. When I went to Iceland, I oh. went to the Phallological Museum. The what? Phallological Museum. The Phallus Museum. Yeah. Don't get too excited. <laughs> no, well, it should be all right. <laughs> Wind up Willy. Well, it's a replacement. <laughs> Angie and I had been together two years before my cancer was discovered. But even that far back, I was avoiding penetration, telling myself it would be OK. What was it? Why couldn't you do it? Um, I think it, it built up over time. I and mean, the problem was, you know, why I wasn't having penetration um, was basically because it was really, really painful. It actually really hurt to, to, to be inside. And, and I just thought, uh, am I being a bit weak? And so I started feeling more vulnerable, basically. So then I just have kind of, yeah, kind of not want to, want to do that so much at all, you know. And did you never look things up online or...? No, I'm not like that. No. Would you be like that? Mm, I don't know. I mean, it's different once you know, isn't it? Because then you yeah. think, oh, God, yeah, you really should. But actually, I think that people don't want to hear worst-case scenarios. So you're always like, oh, it'll go away, it'll do this yeah, and stuff. But, yeah, and you could worry yourself to shit with Dr Google, couldn't you? And you just don't, yeah, you just don't think it's going to be that extreme. Yeah. When I think about how I behaved, I, th I think I was very stupid. Um, and lazy, and I, I, sh I really should have um, try tried to work it out quicker. It took some time for Richard to present. If we'd seen him sooner, we might have been able to, um, to preserve uh, more of the penis and um, preserve more of the, the function for him. I feel like I, I didn't do myself any favours by that. Maybe it sounds crazy if you're not a bloke, but living without a penis leaves you wondering who you are. Though I suppose I've been there before in a way. When I was two weeks old, I was given up for adoption by my Irish mother and started a new life in South London with a new name, a new family, a new brother. If you remember, Mum used to pick you up on Saturday evenings from Teddington sometimes because you were lying about where you'd been and you were pissed on cider if you remember, in Teddington. I do remember. Yeah. I remember hiding in the bushes. I had a really happy childhood with my new family. I didn't think much about my birth mother. Felt unaffected by it until my teenage years, when I began to look for evidence. Opened the cupboard up and there found my original birth certificate. And I just stood there looking at the thing. Dad? He came into the bedroom and said, what are you bloody doing? I said, I've just found out who I am, what I'm at, who my, I am. He said, well, that's none of your bloody business. That's mine and your mother's game. And so I went, what do you mean it's none of my business? Without, with, it wouldn't, ugh. you know. <laughs> but they were lovely. I know he, uh, we had a good time we growing did. up with mum and dad. I've never said to Richard, you know, you're not, we haven't got the same parents or anything, even when we've had one or two set two. No, I've never, never, never said that. At all. You know, he's my brother just as much as, you know. 
Yeah. No, there's no issue about that at all. In fact, I, I should be lucky in many ways that I'm here because Richard was adopted and then it seemed, I think, to relax mum. She did actually have a miscarriage between Richard and me and then I came onto the scene. I was meant to be a girl, apparently, because she wanted a daughter, but she didn't mind. I was a good uh, role model for you. You were. <laughs> How not to live my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of like the idea of being the odd one out for a moment. I started going, fair enough, fuck it. I'm the guy, I'm, you know, like at school, like being the, being the punk, being the one who comes in and has like, like safety pinned their ear to their blazer. <laughs> Or whatever, you know, just like, I'm, I'm extremely weird. I, well, I'm just going to shock you, or, or I don't know. Just, I kind of started to wear it with sort of some sort of pride. I've chosen to uh, make a show about it. I've chosen to do a TV documentary about it. Um, and I've chosen to go to medical conferences and talk as well, because it's my best form of therapy, is, is doing this. And that didn't work either. Couple of years. So now this is me. The bloke with something different about him. Something unusual. And I don't hide it. Working with cancer charities like Orchid and just putting it out there. It really kind of scared me and made me feel, God, there is that kind of poisonous view out there of actually what people think if you haven't got all of your penis, you know. It might, you know, it must have been because you've sexually been totally active and done some very naughty things, or you're dirty, or you're this and that, you know, all these misnomers which are just, just crap. Having a background in alternative comedy and alternative theatre, he obviously knew a way of getting the message out there. So, from my point of view, was, we were more than happy to help him any way we could. I mean, I've been a performer all my life, 30 years. A clown, a lot of it as well. I got a gig in Australia. I went to Australia. I went into the surgery there. So the first doctor I get to see, the, the receptionist just basically says to me, yes, you're here to see Dr Cox? And I went, yes, that's right. Of course I am. <laughs> At the end of the day, you know, the penis is one of man's best friends. It's been there since birth. They've seen it every day, they've touched it every day, used it every day, it's given them some of the best times of their life. So to actually, you know, wake up one morning and find that it's, it's not quite the same, it's disfigured, it's disfigured or, you know, it's gone, um, it's gonna have a deep psychological impact. spoken to a lot of people who've said, you know, if I had bloody penile cancer, that's it, I'd kill myself or, you know, and I've had to say, right, okay. I've been depressed, but never, ever suicidal. I don't know if I've got more penis centric since I don't have it. You know what I mean? Like, kind of thinking about it more because I don't have it. I just had it. I wouldn't think about it so much. Dreaming that I've got a penis and then waking up and finding out that I haven't. Um, various amputation dreams where it comes off. There's one um, where I'm in my mum's house and uh, I'm in the toilet and my penis is wriggling around in my hand, and I'm shouting, Danny, Danny, Danny. And then I, in my mum's bathroom, and standing next to me is Danny DeVito, and I go, and I go, oh, Danny, and I give him my penis, and I, it's in his hand wriggling around. That was quite strange. And I dreamt of a new penis, of having one again, my life been back to what it was. I put my faith in dreams of futuristic science, but as time passed, I came to realize the answer was quite literally within me the whole time. A reconstruction, a new penis made using parts of my own body was something I started to imagine for the very first time. I mean, I was thinking about it in the bath the other day. I was looking down at myself and going, can you imagine just like, 
getting used to having a new one. You know, it's like kind of weird, isn't it? You know, but weird shit's been happening anyway. It had nearly been two years since I'd had my penis removed, but now I was feeling stronger and the time had come to face my fears. I had no idea what a cock made from parts of me would look like, or even how I'd use it. I wonder if you've got your reconstructive one, how, you know, what happens at the end? Do you come? Well, yeah, you come, that's the thing, isn't it? But, um, but then can you, you know, if you're the woman, you can say, or whoever, it could be a guy, but can you say, oh, could you pop your button on again? And that, Do you think you can? I don't know. Can you pop your button on again? <laughs> yeah, just put it on again. <laughs> or, like, if I'm asleep, well, you know, if you say, for example, and you just go, oh, I'm really horny, I'll just, um... Play with this thing. Yeah, I'll just <laughs> pop the button. <laughs> pop the button. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, push my button. Yeah, that's the song. Yeah, I know. I was thinking, pop the button. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just worried, like, you're at a supermarket and you're accidentally rummaging for your, you know, you your card and it sort of, like, just goes off. You know? Have you, have you um, found out how long it will, you know, how long will it take to rise and fall? No, um, no, I don't know these questions yet. I need to see Dr Ralph and mm, ask, ask about uh, up and down, you mm. know. After two years of avoiding those questions, the time had come to find out. I'm interested in sort of talking to Dr Ralph. I think because there's been quite a lot of distance between my last operation and now I'm sort of like getting closer to be able to go, well, actually, maybe I could actually handle that. I could go, go through this. But um, yeah, the, the, the robotic thing, I don't know. I'd probably lose it in a toilet somewhere, but um, no, no, I have to see. It's three operations in total. The first is to make the penis. Yeah. The second operation is to actually sculpt it to make it look more like a penis. Okay. And then the final operation is to put a penile implant inside so that it actually functions like a penis. Right, okay. So. The idea is that you would have sensation in the penis. Yeah. You would be able to stand and pass water as normal. Yeah. Um, and when you pump up the implant, then you'd also be able to have penetrative sex. This is a, a penile prosthesis. Right, OK. And this is put in at the last stage of your surgery. So in other words, once the penis has been formed, right. it's one operation. Yeah and we know that passing water and everything is absolutely fine, then the last operation is to put this inside the penis. Wow. So you have a reservoir full of fluid, which we put inside your tummy. Right. These are the cylinders which go inside the penis. Right. Or the new penis. Yeah. And this is a pump which we put in the scrotum just next to your testicles. Wow. Because you've, that's all normal, that part of yeah. you anyway. Yeah. So then when you want to have sex, you get, you locate this little pump. Right. Takes about 10 minutes, 10 seconds to pump it up. You can see that I'm pumping and fluid is going from the reservoir here yep. in my hand into the cylinders of the penile implant. Wow. And so your penis is now becoming erect. Right. And you can just see how long it's taken me to pump that and you'll be a fairly dab hand at this once it's inside. Or you can get a partner to do it. <laughs> you can. And so the penis is now erect. Right, OK. It will stay erect for as long as you want it to stay erect. And then there's a little button on this pump, which you press at the end, and then the fluid goes so back. So then you... The fluid goes back. So you back. orgasm. You will have a normal male orgasm and ejaculation. Right, OK. Although it won't shoot out as much as it does because part of the waterworks is not there, but yeah. from your point of view, yeah. And you can see the implant is now flaccid, so your penis right. will be floppy again. It seemed a bit weird to have all this sort of, you know, stuff inside you. You know, the idea that you've got this, this pump in your scrotum. 
It's weird. I mean, let's face it. Do you want to have a look at some of the photographs and we can show you the yeah. different types? As you can see, um, this is the end result. This, this is still attached to the patient. Hmm. So this is the waterworks here. Yeah. This is the flap wrapped inside this tube here. Yeah. Still attached to its blood vessels and nerves. This is after the first operation. You can see you've got a penis. Yeah. You're passing water from it. Mm. Um, and then the next operation, so this is what we call sculpting to, to make the glands appearance, to make it look more realistic. Right. I'm a bit scared, really. Sort of something off Doctor Who from the 70s. Sort of maggot thing. And then I was kind of gone, actually, it does look all right once it's got the top on it and stuff, you know. Um, so you can see that looks a little bit more realistic. Yeah. And then the final, we've talked about the penile implant. Uh, so this is it deflated and then pumped up. Just some examples. So these are penile cancer patients having had a phalloplasty. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. These are the options that you just have to make a decision. Yeah. I'm really actually now quite focused on like, Okay, I can do this. I can do eight hours of surgery, ten hours of surgery. I can handle a week in hospital. I'm not bothered about that. Uh, the outcome is could be pretty good, really. He says I'm healthy. Um, a year, I can handle that uh, definitely. So yeah, I'm feeling like I'm going to do this. <laughs> After the worst period of my life, it was time for the resurrection. Well, that's what I called it anyway. A party to celebrate my decision to get a new penis with everyone who'd helped me on my journey, there to share the moment with me. It's a combination of a couple of years of shit, really, and, and good, good and bad. So um, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a really good night tonight. I mean, wouldn't be here if I hadn't lost my penis, let's face it. Nobody would have come out on the 13th of February for me if I hadn't lost my dick. And that kind of, that's, that's the bottom line here. That's why it's called the resurrection party. Oh yes, because I'm going to have myself a reconstructed penis. Hey, hey. Hey. And it's a really easy operation. It's fantastic. Only takes about a year. It takes first operations only takes eight hours and all they do, all they do is just take off a bit of your arm, roll that up, turn that into a penis, but it kind of looks like a weird maggot, and then they take off a bit of your arse and put that on your arm and uh, everything starts moving around your body kind of weirdly. <laughs> so right, what if my arm becomes my cock, but it still thinks it's my arm and it's going around shaking hands with people? <laughs> Okay, trying to pick up pints, <laughs> pick my nose, you know what I mean? What a fucking disaster. God knows what my arse is going to think being my arm. <laughs> to the resurrection! The resurrection! Resurrection! To the resurrection!